Well, I talked about um, estimation. For example, we use our sample mean as our best point estimate of the population mean. Notice the difference between what we were talking about before, descriptive statistics, where we just summarize our data, say by a few numbers, mean, standard deviation, and a picture. And now we're doing something different. We're making an inference from our data to the population. So we need inferential statistics. And here is the first important inferential statistic. It's the confidence interval, a beautiful, powerful, wonderful tool that summarizes an experimental result very compactly and also has a lovely picture. Now, you could um, publish in the newspaper. On the front page of the paper, you might read, support for the Prime Minister is 45% in a poll with an error margin of 3%. You might even have a picture like this, a dot marking 45 and this error bar marking three above, up to 48, and three below, each being the error margin of 3%. And I suspect most people would understand what's going on here, because it's pretty simple. We have in mind that out there in the population, there's some sort of true level of support for the Prime Minister. But we'll never know that unless we uh, can hold a general election or have a survey of everyone in the country, and that's not really practical. So we take a sample maybe of a thousand people, and we'll assume it's a random sample. There are other ways of sampling, quota sampling, stratified, uh, strata sampling, and so on, but let's stick with what we're doing, random sampling. Let's assume we take fully random thousand people and ask them about their support, well, our survey showed 45% of the sample supported the Prime Minister. So that's our point estimate of the true level of support in the population. Suppose we did it again with a different sample of 1,000 people. Would we get the same result? Think of dance and the means. Not quite. Well, how different would it be? Well, that's what the margin of error tells us. And so, 45 plus or minus MOE, the margin of error, is our interval estimate of the true level. So this picture here, which is in fact a 95% confidence interval, is our interval estimate of support for the Prime Minister. And if we did the experiment again, most likely, not guaranteed, but most likely we get a result within this confidence interval. We might get 46, we might get 42 and a half, but we pretty definitely, almost certainly, would not get 40 or not get 50. Most likely, we get some value around about 44, 45, 46 in the middle of the confidence interval. MOE, the margin of error, gives us the precision. It's a measure of the precision of our estimate. Do you prefer a short confidence interval or a long one? Would you like a big MOE or a small one? Well, you're dead right. We really prefer short confidence intervals. We really prefer small margins of error. We'd like MOE to be shorter. Of course, it would be a much more uh, helpful poll if it had a margin of error of only 1% or half a percent. But to get that, we might have to poll 10,000 people. More expense, more delay. So as usual in experimental design, there's a trade-off between the amount of precision we get and the amount of effort and expense and time that has to go into our sampling. Let's simulate this in ESCII. So we, here we are again with our population of pain ratings. Population mean 50 and standard deviation 20. And I'm going to take a whole lot of samples of size 20 and pile them up into the um, sampling distribution. And I'm going to turn on that curve and I'm going to turn on the tram lines again showing MOE, about two standard errors above and below the mean. Let's stop that there. So focus on this difference, MOE, about 10 points. And this diagram illustrates, shows us that nearly all the sample means are within MOE of the population mean. 
nearly all, 95% of the sample means are within MOE of the population mean. Hold that thought. Let me turn this off and show the dance of the means. Now I'm going to draw uh, an interval here, plus and minus MOE, either side of my sample mean. And this is the 95% confidence interval. So if most of these sample means are within MOE of the population mean, that implies that in most of these cases, this population mean will be within MOE of the sample mean. Whew. If A is close to B, B is close to A. Most of these sample means are pretty close to the population mean, so if I only know the sample mean, my best guess is that the population mean is pretty close. And it turns out that these confidence intervals, which we calculate from the sample data, have a really interesting property. I'm going to run them here, like so. It turns out that these 95% confidence intervals have a really interesting property, sort of the defining one. 95% of them, in 95% of cases, the confidence interval captures the population mean. And I've illustrated that here by making the ones that don't capture red. So what proportion in the long run of these will be red? You're right, 5%. In 95% of cases, these intervals will capture the value we're trying to estimate, the population mean, and in 5% they won't. So at the moment, I'm keeping count of how many capture. I'm up around about 97%, 96%. If we left it running for 10 minutes, it would be very close to, oh, we're down to 95.6%. It bounces around, slowly settles down. But as you look at this dance of the confidence intervals, it looks very lumpy. We might get a whole screen full of green, then we might get a couple of red quite close together. Randomness is very tricky. In the short run, it's very surprising, very lumpy. In the long run, it's ironclad, precisely 95%. We're not very good at thinking about and coping with randomness. I mean, that's why the casinos are in business and they take vast amount of money from us, because we're believing that by looking at these trends, we can guess what's going to happen next. But in fact, we can't. It's purely random, purely independent. There might be lumps every now and again. But in the long run, the casino wins because it's basing its calculations on this 95%. Look, ours happens to be down to 94% at the moment. Leave it for a while longer, it'll be very close to 95. So running an experiment is like closing your eyes and grabbing one of these confidence intervals off the screen. What's your chance you get a red one? About 5%. Will you ever know? No, you don't. So we have to bear in mind that there's a small chance that this confidence interval we calculated from our data might be red. And that's one of the slogans. We think about interpreting confidence interval, it might be red. Next question. These are 95% intervals. Well, we can have 90% and 99% intervals. Would 99% intervals be uh, wider or narrower? Aha, let's try it. Let's make them up to 99. And in fact, they're wider. Oh, this red one has disappeared. It's now green. If we want to capture the population mean uh, more often, 99% of the time, then we need longer intervals. And of course, 90% intervals are relatively shorter. But just about all the time we choose 95 because that's a sort of standardized um, level of confidence that turns out in practice to be pretty useful. So I'm talking about um, uh, confidence intervals and how beautiful and helpful they are. And yes, indeed, with confidence intervals, you can make beautiful data music. And here's the summary again. You can go to this website and get more information uh, about this book, download the software and various other goodies.